Hey everybody, my name is Tom Blount. I'm one of the pastors here at Heritage Church, and I'm really excited to be with you here today. Thanks so much for joining in with us, either online or on Facebook. You know, we live in such amazing times right now, and you would say, well, what do you mean amazing? Uncertainty, yes, I understand. COVID-19, unbelievable times in this shelter in place, probably driving a lot of you absolutely crazy. And I'm telling you what, it is uncertain, but there's certainty many, many times as you just go to the Lord, not knowing for sure what's going to happen, but by faith we continue to move along. I want to thank many of those who are on the front lines, the healthcare workers, the food industrial workers, and people that serve us in those areas, firefighters, police, and uh, it's just amazing uh, what they're doing out there on the front lines, taking care of us. And I know you want to get back out there, but we're just going to have to be a little more patient. Now, last week, perhaps you were online. I know that I was online with my family and enjoying the message that Pastor uh, Jeff gave uh, with the new Fearless series that I'll get to in just a moment. But I got to be totally honest with you is I'm kind of enjoying this church at home thing. I grew up as a good, fundamental, independent, Bible-believing person going to church all the time. I can't wait to tell my dad that we've been doing church, full-blown church, and watching God do amazing things, and we're sitting in our pajamas, sitting on the couch, sitting in a lazy boy, family all gathered together. So we've had a really, really good time, but I hope you've been doing well as also. Hey, listen, uh, I know Pastor Jeff seems to have these really cool memes, and so I thought, man, they're going to have me speak, and if I don't do a meme, uh, I'm going to be in trouble because a lot of people really like some of these things because we're learning a lot about this coronavirus thing and then what it does does is shelter in place. But I want you to think about this. Many of you actually have an animal at home, specifically a dog. And I want you to check this out. I couldn't figure out myself why animals got so excited when people walked by, but now in this day and age, I'm here to tell you, now we understand why the dog gets so excited uh, when somebody just walks by the house. Now, Another thing that we're learning is uh, some people are going crazy. I, I've had the awesome privilege of watching my son uh, a school my two grandkids, and it's frustrating times. I'm just going to be honest with you. I, my wife and I believe wholeheartedly that when you become a homeschooler, a teacher of your children, you got to be called of God to do that. And so I don't believe we ever thought we were called of God. But I want to show you something. Now, Sue is a homeschooler. Now, Sue's only 31 years old, and she's been teaching her children for the last few weeks. And so I want to caution you, uh, just be careful. Uh, just keep trusting the Lord. And a lot of things have changed. Think about this. When the NHL comes back, in full-fledged, and we're here, and the Stanley Cup is presented, I want you to understand, <laughs> this is kind of interesting, uh, this will probably be the new Stanley Cup, but nonetheless, I hope you're doing well back there where you're at, I know that you're getting out, we're getting out, doing some hiking and some fishing, uh, taking the dog out, uh, I got a makeshift office at the church up in the conference room, my business is totally shut down for the last month. But I go there every day, and I take my, my dog, Harley. He loves it. And so I know you're doing certain things, but we're in this fearless series looking at some Old Testament stories. Now, i got to be honest with you. Growing up in, in church, I have heard a lot about Old Testament characters and the stories and the flannel graphs. And, man, some of you going to church now, we used to put – we won't even go there, but nonetheless – it's fascinating to absolutely 
hear those stories of old, and some of the characters, they're just, they seem like they're fearlessly living a life, and it's like, I'll never be able to mount up to that. I'll never be able to actually accomplish some of those things. Overcoming the insurmountable odds, as we were taught last week, and Gideon trusting God and all that was going on there, or David slaying a giant, and uh, all the different things, all of these obstacles come up, and it seems like, man, they just keep going forward, and me, I don't know. I don't know if I could do that, but I want to encourage all of you. We are all in the same boat, so to speak. We are all the same. Every single one of us has fears. I mean, you might call some people that they have anxiety. I get all of that, but there's fears. It begins to just swell up inside us. We all have fears, so I want to encourage you. You can look at those Old Testament stories and read all those things and be encouraged and absolutely have inspiration to continue, but I want you to understand, they all had fears as well because it was interesting last week, seated there in our living room, Pastor Jeff made a statement. Now, I've studied a lot about uh, individuals, and I've read a lot of books, but something he said that I believe Pastor Kevin gave to him, and, and I really appreciate the teaching team here at Heritage Church, but he said this. He said that we're all born with two types of fears, and the fear of falling and the fear of loud noises. But that would mean, as he unpacked that for us, is that that would mean that then the rest of the fears in our lives are learned fears. And so when you think about it, that's good news. Because if we can learn a fear, then by the grace of God enabling us and working in our lives, we can unlearn that fear and begin to trust him more. So we all have fears. I have fears. I'm telling you right now, if you talk to some of my friends and they would be laughing and they're probably going to laugh right now is I absolutely have a fear of heights. I don't know how it came to be. I searched it back after I found out it was a learned fear. I'm hoping I can unlearn it. But man, I've been in situations where it's almost a little embarrassing. Don't like heights. And so I want you to understand, I, I have fears of other things. You have fears. I have fears. And so we're going to continue to talk about that from the standpoint of living fearless. I want you to understand that we together can learn to fear less. And so I was doing some work and doing some study on this subject. And I came across an article that is in the Entrepreneur Magazine. And it was published and written by a gentleman by the name of Matt Mayberry. Now, he's a speaker and a maximum performance strategic kind of guy, and I want you to catch and listen to what he said about fear, because I hope somehow, some way, we can relate together and see if we can learn something. What do we do with our fear? Matt said this, if there is one thing that holds millions of people back each day from growing as an individual achieving high levels of success, and becoming the best version of themselves, fear is definitely at the top of the list. He goes on to say, from the standpoint of fear within the lives of individuals, he says this, and catch what he says. I lost my place because all of a sudden my screen went black. But he says this. He says, high achievers are individuals that also have fears come into their lives off and on. He talks about later on where he actually begins to unpack this and he says this, the question comes to their minds when they face this fear is that they begin to question whether they should move forward. He says this, one thing I want you to understand is that fear is absolutely normal. He said even the best experience fear from time to time. The key is not to let that fear hold you back and prevent you from taking action and going after what you want in life. And I'd like to say this, when he said that, he hopes that you would understand that fear is absolutely normal. Listen, that's the point I want you to understand today, is it's impossible to live a fearless life. You probably ran into people who say, well, I don't have any fears at all. That's not, that's not a true statement. We all wear masks as well, and that's what they're hiding behind. We all have a fear, but we need to go after 
the design of what God has in our lives as we follow Jesus Christ. Now, I don't know if you're a follower of Christ. I don't know if you're just trying to figure this thing out, but I'm here to tell you today that we do have someone that we can take our fears to. So I'm hoping somehow as we continue to look at this uh, fearless series and look at some of the Old Testament characters and look at the stories, I can be of a help to you. So we're going to look at Joseph today. And I'm hoping and praying that by time we're done in the short period of time we have together, how is it that you and I can live life with less fear? So let me ask you a question right out of the the gate. What is your greatest fear? What do you personally fear? you got to have something there. I already shared with you that my, my fear is a fear of heights. Now, we all have some commonalities. I want you to know that. We all have some commonalities. Across the board, it's been shown many times in the United States that the top two fears seem to go hand in hand once in a while is that what we have is it's public speaking. Public speaking, having to stand up in front of a a, a group or an audience, people just get so fearful with that. And the second one is death itself. So public speaking Somebody might just die right there because it's the top two fears. But here's the thing. I get to thinking about death, and I want to bring this into you because you might not be able to relate to Joseph today and all of what he went through. But I believe you can relate with this. Many times we fear the death of a relationship. We fear the death of a marriage. We feel the death of our economy where we're at right now. I have no idea what you're personally going through, but that also could be included with that. Maybe you have a fear of public speaking. Maybe you have a fear of death. But I want you to understand, sometimes fear is good. We can learn some things that fear is good. Many years ago, President Franklin D. Roosevelt said this, let me assert my firm belief that the only thing that we have to fear is fear itself. Nameless, unreasoning, unjustified terror which paralyzes needed efforts to convert retreat into advance. Now we know that these words were spoken in the height of the Great Depression, but it's a vivid reminder that even in the midst of where they were, what was stoking the fire of this economic turmoil was absolute fear. People were just so fearful of it. And I want you to understand, fear is stoking us today in all that people are going through. So be very careful what you read. Be very careful what you listen to. Make sure you're getting it from reliable sources. Yes, wash your hands. Yes, wear a mask if you feel you need to. Yes, practice social distancing. But I want you to understand I believe that if we don't look at this in a positive sense, we're going to have some great stories, I'm telling you, to tell other people of what took place in our lives during this time. Now, here's something about fear. I believe this with all my heart, been around the ministry my entire life, and I'm so thankful for that. But fear is one of the greatest enemies that I've ever seen of faith. It paralyzes us. It's taking us to the point where we're supposed to take some important steps moving forward in obedience to Christ as we follow him and doing certain things, but entrusting all of that to him. But I want you to understand, if you're fearful, you won't take that step. And I know God's calling you to do some things where you are and serve your community. So let me just give you this. There's no way possible in the time that I have allotted today to be able to tell you all of Joseph's story, all the details. But I will tell you this, you're going to remember some of the things that I forgot to say or I want you to go back and I'll give you the areas that you can read this and you can read it all for yourself. You can read it all in about 15 minutes. In fact, it's Genesis chapter 39 all through chapter 50. He actually comes on the scene in Genesis 30, but you can read that for yourself. Now, Joseph is a son to Jacob and Rachel, okay? He's a young man at this time in his life. Perhaps he's a little bit overconfident. I I wouldn't say that absolutely for sure, but you'd understand as you read the story of his dreams that he aspired because God gave him a dream in his heart and he began to believe it and he began to act upon it and unfortunately shared it with his brothers. Now, also he had natural self-assurance, but that confidence and that assurance grew even more 
because there was something about Joseph's life that maybe you can relate to is Joseph was actually Jacob's favorite son. Now, that's a problem in families, and I want you to understand, maybe you can relate to that. I mean, I'm telling you what, I miss my brothers. They're, they've already died and gone home to be with the Lord, but my point is this. I, I could joke about it and say, yeah, I was the favorite. Hey, listen, maybe you live in that environment knowing one of your siblings is the favorite, and you know how that kind of grinds on you a little bit. But here's another thing. Joseph, knowing God's plan for his life, I believe began to get very unbearable on his 10 older brothers. So we eventually see them, his older brothers, conspire as they see Joseph coming a distance and checking on him where they were. They knew it was their brother. They knew he was the favorite son. And they're like, we gotta get rid of this guy. They conspired against their own flesh and blood and sold Joseph into slavery to a man by the name of Potiphar. Now, I want you to think about this for a moment. You're going to see in his life that perhaps his self-assurance molded him by all the painful experiences of his life, combined with a personal knowledge of God and what God had called him to do, allowed him to perhaps survive and prosper in amongst all that when I have to be up front with you where most of us, and I'm just going to point to myself, most of us, myself, would have failed. Going through all that he did, all that he went through, all that he experienced, perhaps others would have failed. Now Joseph, as he matured, added a quiet wisdom, so to speak, to his life. He actually won the hearts over of everyone that he met by the way, by the way that he lived amongst them and, and initiated in their lives. Potiphar loved him. The warden where he spent time in prison that he should not have been there loved him. The prisoners themselves were drawn to him. Pharaoh himself loved him. Even after many years, you'll find in the reading of Joseph's life, his ten brothers are won over by him, of which we'll get to in just a moment. So perhaps you, Today, where you're at, maybe you can identify, if I could break it down to you this way, maybe you can identify with one or more of some of the hardships Joseph faced, because you see, Joseph was betrayed. Have you ever been betrayed? Joseph was deserted by his family. Perhaps you feel that you have been deserted by your family. You see, I want you to understand, Joseph, he was exposed to sexual temptation and punished for doing what was right. He endured a long imprisonment that he should not have been there, but he trusted God with it. Did he have fear? He had to have some type of fear, but he placed that fear where it belonged. He was forgotten by those in the prison that he shared with and other dreams that were given and he interpreted those dreams and then somebody forgot him. And as I said, you can read all of that about Joseph in Genesis chapter 39 through 50, but here's something that just strikes me amazing about this character in the Bible, this man who lived for God. What Joseph did in every situation, there seems to be this common denominator that he was gracious he, he was positive in his response. He transformed each and every one of his setbacks, but moved forward as though appearing to be fearless. I don't know about you, but I don't know if I, I could do that. And so when I look at that, I think, man, he is a fearless Old Testament character in my book. He's like a warrior. Now, we would say, oh, no, a warrior. Say, hey, sometimes those people that just trust in the midst of everything, man, to me, they're true warriors. The challenges and obstacles that he went through is amazing, but he didn't spend much time asking why. Have you ever gotten to that situation in your life? Why me? Why not somebody else? I, I, I call that a pity party for myself. Tom, don't have pity parties. I had a mentor one time tell me, when you want to move on, You don't get historical, bringing up the past, don't have a pity party, and just work hard trusting God with the results. So what we saw him do is instead of asking why, it seemed like in every situation he would just kind of say, well, what should I do? Man, that's what we ought to do when Jesus is just working. Hey, Jesus, what should I do here? So those who met 
Joseph. It's interesting. It didn't matter where he went, what he did, here's what they saw. And you'll find it all throughout. It's interwoven all throughout those passages. God was with Joseph. I want you to hear that again. God was with Joseph. I want you to hear the fact that God is with you if you are in Christ. God is initiated in your life today. Perhaps the lesson we could draw from this is any time that we have challenges, any time that we have setbacks, maybe from the very beginning, maybe we could just respond a little different with the mindset and the attitude that we believe that God is with me. Maybe in the midst of what you're going through, if you could just softly and just take it in, God is with me. And I, I understand that sometimes that physical presence is something that we just put so much hope and trust in. But let me give you a truth. There is nothing like the presence of Jesus to shed new light in a dark situation. That's what I'm asking you to do. Ask Jesus. You say, what should I do? Ask Jesus. You see, Joseph had weaknesses. Perhaps in his youth, as we all were, maybe there was a little bit of pride there, caused a little friction with his brothers. But his strengths, when you think about it, he was, a, he was what? He was a slave, then became a ruler of Egypt, and then began to be known for his integrity and his honesty. He was known for spiritual insight and very compassionate, prepared an entire nation that when part of his dream is that the nation would experience a famine in the land. And he prepared that entire nation to win. So let me ask you a question. How do we live with less fear? How do you and I today live with less fear? Let me give you just a couple things. Understand fear and embrace it. Understand fear and embrace it. We got to be honest with our feelings and understand they're there, but don't always believe them. Be honest about your fears, but don't always believe them. Understand, many times we will say, well, fear is an acronym that can be used as false evidence appearing real. Well, okay, but the fear is still there, so the fear is real. It just might be based upon false evidence. But just make sure you understand that fear will be there. Embrace it and be very careful what you think on. And we'll talk about that in a moment because what you think, you feel. And so we want to be very careful on that. So I want you to understand fear and embrace it. But number two is this, rewire your brain. Rewire the brain. It's kind of like that old uh, adage that we knew years ago when computers first came in, garbage in garbage out. We have got to get to the point, and it's the surest way that we rewire our brains, build courage that is needed to move on. Maybe you would develop mantras. Maybe you'd come up with a favorite verse that God has given to you. Maybe there's some affirmations that would build you up, not tear you down. Increase your self-confidence. Maybe you need to read a good self-help book, but always stay in the Word. Maybe you just need to get with somebody else that, that's more positive and rewire your brain and think differently. Because, you know, think about this. In those very informative years of our lives, beginning as a child, many times we were told what? You can't do this, or you can't be this, or you can't have so there's a lot of negatives, and I understand the reason why some of those were said, but I know as a parent many times I probably said them when I shouldn't have said them. So from the very beginning, we do have that negativity that comes into us, but here's something I want you to catch. If you don't take the initiative to rewire your brain, life will do it for you. Think about all the things that are bombarding you right now in your household over the past four to six weeks. If you're not careful, thinking on those brings forth what? Those types of thoughts, feelings, and actions. So here's something I want us to remember. Perhaps you fear right now where you're at. The things you've already done, the things you've already experienced have already set the course of your life, and there's no way it's going to change. You have got to get rid of that type of thinking because it's so important that we move on. Sometimes you believe it'll never change. It's always going to be the same. Paul was writing this in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. He said, don't copy the behaviors and customs of this world, but let God transform you 
into a new person by changing the way you think. By changing the way you think. Then, he says, change the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. There's got to be a transformation of the mind, a renewal by Jesus Christ. A great old author, C.S. Lewis, said this, you can't go back and change the beginning, but you can start where you are and change the ending. I'm asking you today, you're going to tell a story one day of what took place in your life during this time, COVID-19, coronavirus, shelter in place. You're saying, oh, I'm never going to tell it. You will tell it. It's not if, it's just when. But you only have one chance to write the story. And I'm asking you, by Jesus Christ, enabling grace, may he help you write that story that thousands would read and be encouraged by it. Paul said this in Romans 8, 1. So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. I have found in my ministry and in my life, Fear grips the heart of people because they live underneath this condemnation of guilt and shame and sorrow. Jesus bore your guilt. Jesus bore your shame. He bore your sorrow. He was punished so that you didn't have to be punished. You're punishing yourself. If you are in Christ, saved by the shed blood of Jesus Christ, there is no more, con now listen, no more condemnation. He's not telling you it's okay to go do what you want to do and sin. No. But stop living underneath the regret of what you've done. Move on and trust Jesus with that. So we realize within what we're studying today, understand there's fear going to be there in your life. Embrace it. Rewire your brain. But it takes me to this, it has to happen. If you rewire your brain, you have got to start thinking more success and not a failure. Let me give you the example. Joseph went through all of what he went through, but before he went through all of it, when he's getting ready to be sold at the auction block, so to speak, here's an interesting passage of scripture in Genesis 39 2. It says, The Lord was with Joseph, so he succeeded in everything he did as he served in the home of his Egyptian master. Now, I want you to catch this. His brother sold him to a, to a slave owner. And here's what we have. We have a man that has been stripped of everything, his dignity. He doesn't own a home. He doesn't own a car. He doesn't have a bank account. He doesn't have anything. He doesn't own anything. For all we know, he owes nothing, and clothes included. My point is this. God says in his word, as he speaks to you and I today, in your situation, the Lord was with Joseph so he succeeded in everything he did. How is that possible? I want you to think about this. Here's the key. It is the presence of the Lord in your life that makes you success. You successful. You have great success. You can, you can do this, but you can't do it alone. Philippians chapter 4 verse 8 says this. Paul is pinning this, and I love this, because we we gravitate to what we think about, and we become those things that we think about. He says, now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Listen, I know that in the midst of your situation, immediately you can say, well, where I'm at is true. I'm telling you, it's truthfully happening. I understand that. But when we fix our eyes on the truth of the word of God and we fix our eyes on things that are excellent and worthy of praise, things will happen because thinking is a choice. Thinking is a choice. I may not be able to always control what enters in, but I don't have to dwell there very long. Joseph could have chose to think about that his brothers hated him and sold him into slavery. He could have been thinking all the time and dwelling on it that Potiphar's wife, when she made sexual advancements to him and he did the right thing and he ran and then lied upon, he could have thought, well, she lied about me. He could have thought, well, man, I gave the interpretation of the dream 
and the baker forgot about me when he was released out of jail, Joseph chose to remember some things that you'll see interwoven all through the passages is this. You, Joseph, are a successful man. Why? Because I am with you. He chose to remember things like, you'll see in verses where it says, God's presence is with you. You need to go back and read it and get all the detail. Be inspired by it. Understand that God loves you and he is with you today. That you can have great success. And I'm not telling you this is a name it and claim it thing. I'm telling you the greatest success that I believe could ever be written about a Christian is that they are in Christ. I can't take any credit for it. You can't take any credit for it. So here's the thing I want us to understand. We choose what we're going to dwell on and by God's grace, may we understand fear and embrace it. May we also allow God to transform us by the renewing of our minds through Christ Jesus and think success, not failure. And here's what I believe. We need to entrust your fears to Jesus. We need to entrust our fears to Jesus. It's an amazing thing. Joseph, many years have passed. He's went through all of these experiences. He's now married. He has a couple of some children and there's a nationwide famine going on currently. Jacob, the father, sends, to, he thinks his son's dead, by the way. I left all that part out. He thinks his son's dead. He's always lived in, in just fear and thinking, oh, my favorite son is gone. Jacob sends the boys to go get some food where, Je, where now Joseph is ruler of and takes care of and is in charge of. He's getting ready to reveal himself to his brothers after all these years. The ones that sold him. The ones that actually said, let's kill him first. And then, no, 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 let's not have his blood upon our hands. So they sold him. They betrayed him. They thought more of themselves than Joseph. And look at what he says to them when he presents himself to them. He said, hey, guys, you intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. He brought me to this position so I could save the lives of many. I believe with all my heart that what Joseph chose to focus on was that God is with me. I'm going to entrust my life to God. I'm going to entrust the circumstances to God. And he knew his design, catch this, his design as God creating him was to follow God, to lean upon God, not trust in his own ways. He couldn't figure it out if he tried, but he trusted God in the midst of all the circumstances. But I want you to catch this. When John is writing this in chapter 15, he brings it full circle to us, all the way from the patriarchs of old to now. And he says this, Jesus says this, yes, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. Listen to what he says, for apart from me, apart from Jesus, you can do nothing. You say, Pastor Tom, I could do some things. No, he says, I'm just going to take him at his word. He says, and I believe this with me, you can do nothing without me. Listen to me. Making the bold decision not to fear and hold you back anymore from what you've been designed by God. You are a masterpiece, Paul says in Ephesians 2.10. He says, a masterpiece made by God, created for good things. He said, you're a work of art. You need to go forward, but you can't allow fear to hold you back anymore in the decisions that you need to make and have future success. You say, what are you talking about success? Look, you could have success spiritually, relationally, financially, physically, mentally, emotionally. But here's the thing. It's not going to happen overnight, and you're not going to do it on your own. You have been designed by an amazing creator to be inhabited by him. You could be his temple. And I don't know where you're at spiritually with Christ today, but I'm here to tell you that he designed you to lead you, guide you, to depend upon him. And so may we entrust all of what we work in and through and with Jesus Christ. Let me leave you with this. Everything that you want in life is past your comfort zone. Don't let fear be the reason you live a half-lived life. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, I'm asking you right now. 
by the shed blood of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. That you would allow us just a moment to thank you. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for being with us in every situation of life. But Lord, thank you right now for being with us through this coronavirus pandemic. Lord, thank you for your presence. Thank you that your, your word is so true and it says you would never leave us nor forsake us. Thank you, Lord, that you are the most amazing thing that we can have in our lives in the very presence in our lives and with us. We are successful because you're in us. So may we think upon that. So Jesus, in everything that we have to do today, in everything that we need to do in the days and weeks and months to come, I pray a blessing upon those today that have watched this, that you would financially meet all of their needs, that physically you would take care of them, mentally you would give them clarity and a peace of mind. Lord, I'm asking that you'd build relationships and memories during this time as never before. We'll look back and celebrate them of what the Lord has done. But Father, my heart's cry right now is this. Perhaps there's somebody listening right now, watching right now, that doesn't know beyond any shadow of a doubt that if they were to die, heaven would be their home. Lord, would you draw them? Would you draw them? And so we thank you for speaking to us today. We thank you for all that you're doing in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I want to thank you again for allowing me into your home or wherever you watch this today. Perhaps it was on your lunch hour, whatever. If you're working, thank you. But perhaps you know that you need to ask Jesus Christ. You know that you've never asked Jesus to forgive you of your sins and come into your heart. I'm going to ask you right now, if that is your desire, would you receive him right now? Would you admit that you're a sinner and would you believe that Jesus took your place upon the cross of Calvary and just say something like this, Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. Come into my heart and save me. It's my desire to be a follower of Christ. Why don't you do that today? And if perhaps you did that today, I want to invite you to get on to heritagechurch.com. And there's a little connection card in there that you could fill out. Would you please let us know here at Heritage Church, let us know you receive Christ. We want to make sure you get some information that will help you in growing you in the faith. We're not going to do anything with the information you give us. We just want to reach out to you and give you some free information. So thanks again for joining us today. God bless you. You're blessed, favored, and loved all because of the finished work of the cross. I'll see you soon.